Thank you and welcome. So, today we're going to try an experiment. It's really the first time I'm doing this in a academic setting. And I'm going to need you because we're going to collaborate and I'm going to co-create uh, a talk. We have the topic here, how to write the book of your life. And we're going to try to think a little bit about it. Both of us will try to think. Uh, Pieter will think in music, and I will try to think with words around the words that you will give me. So I will ask each of you to give me a word. If possible, inspired by the topic, uh, but it can also be uh, the first two words that come uh, to your mind. So we, we'll go around first one word each, and then we'll, we'll, we'll start again. Would you like to start? Meditation. Meditation. Thank you. Mother. Mother. Bubble. Bubble. Challenges. Challenges. Evolution. Evolution. Life. Life. Experience. Experience. And one, one again for all of you. Uh, stuckness. Stuckness. Would you like to give us a word? Enthusiasm. Enthusiasm. Ocean. Ocean. Lost. Lost. <laughs> History. History. Ordinary. Ordinary. Travel. Travel. Troubles. Troubles. You notice how he says the words like, take this one, and see, <laughs> let's see what you can do with this one. <laughs> Troubles. Uh, the person who has arrived, would you like to give me two words um, inspired by the topic, how to write the book of your life? Unapologetic. Unapologetic. Um, time. Time. And one more from Vera. Voyage. Voyage. Okay. So we have meditation, mother, bubble, challenges, evolution, life, experience, stuckness, enthusiasm, ocean, lost, history, Ordinary, trouble, troubles, unapologetic, time, and voyage. And now for the next 20 minutes I will only repeat this world until, until you get hypnotized. <laughs> Close your eyes if you want, there's not much to see. <laughs> this is going to be a meditation. An improvised meditation about the journey we call life. Of course I've already quoted three words in less than 30 seconds, <laughs> which is not advisable. But isn't it what we do in the first decades of our life and perhaps our entire life, we keep repeating the same words, the same hopes, perhaps the same mistakes, but also 
the same generous acts. Now there is this idea that to meditate you need to empty your mind. I, it's one of the reasons why I don't do yoga. Because whenever I go to a yoga class and I hear empty your mind, I say, sorry, I cannot do that. I'm a philosopher. Stop thinking. <laughs> no, <laughs> sorry, cannot do that. And this is what I mean by the book of your life. As a philosophical counselor, I try to help people rediscover the fact that we are integral beings that need to think as much as we need to breathe. And to think is not a disease. In this picture you see my daughter and uh, this weekend for some reason I said the word disease and she found that word was very very funny and then we were playing for half an hour about diseases we were wa watching outside and say look a walking disease etc but we all have these easies in that sense there are many things that for us are not easy I'm sure we can all find here something with us that is extremely difficult and that seems so easy for the others but one thing I think is difficult for everybody is to write the book of our life to lead our lives as if it were a book with a beginning, a middle and an end something consistent something, something even perhaps worth telling and of course by worth telling I mean not only to your mother who might or might not be a good listener I see here is bubble and challenges and usually we say that okay for example tell someone go out of your bubble right and as if it's something negative to have a, a world of our own and we see challenges as something positive and it might be true but we can also think in another way. We can think that in this life, in this existence that we share, at least in this space-time, not a lot of us did actually manage to constitute her own bubble that yet would be open enough to outside reality without jeopardizing one's integrity. That's a strange image, right? You have a bubble with holes and uh, some form of energy, perhaps an aura, perhaps love, perhaps inspiration, poetry, words, music go out through the world, through the holes, and throughout the world. That would be a real challenge as opposed to 
this pre-scripted challenge that we find about today as boxes that we tick to make sure that we have the right titles. Some of us clicking boxes all the way up to the Nobel Prize. And they call that evolution. And it seems to me that, in fact, I don't know what your opinion about that is, but sometimes I think it's hard for most of people to evolve. It's hard for those who think they don't evolve, it's hard also for those who think they evolve. In psychoanalysis, they call it sometimes the compulsion of repetition. We think we are so... We think we got there, we think we solved a lot of things. And suddenly, we find ourselves doing the same mistake we did 25 years ago. And we realize that we turn in circles. And that's life. And perhaps they are not circles, perhaps they are spirals. We have the illusion that we are going back, but in fact it's a spiral or a, a Mobius strip. the way they saw themselves where they really thought okay now I am perhaps partly someone else or maybe completely someone else hmm. I've never experienced I were completely someone else and I won't ask who in the room has because it might be perhaps a personal question and the thing is if you experienced that at some point of your life you became totally someone else are you still writing the same book or should you start another book is it an illusion that you are someone else itself might be what has changed. Perhaps we have different forms of stuckness that evolve through time. And I don't know if that is helpful, but it might be in the sense that I think we can leave a certain time with a stuckness. Actually, a stuckness can be quite creative for a while so perhaps a creative person an artist for example a writer is someone who creates new stucknesses 
every six months or one year. And thinking about that, in fact, one book is hardly ever written by one only person. Think about yourselves, your psychology. Most of the time we are changing and actually to write a book is sometimes to fight again this against this entropy that is created by the fact that over the years the author is not completely the same. At least to be honest, to say something personal, that is often how I write books. Actually my books, whether they are theoretical or where they are novels, are written in perhaps 30 or 40 different layers. It's like the, uh, I think it's polder, I think the, uh, the uh, um, in Holland they call it polder, when you conquer uh, the sea, you build land on the sea. And that's how I feel when I write books. And I have to go back again and again to the beginning, because I don't recognize completely the author of the first chapter and then the author of the second chapter comes back and edits the author of the first chapter and by the time there are 30 chapters we have 30 authors if possible in the end the 31st author thinks I got this under control <laughs> I have the big picture vision and I can come up with a title. And the title sometimes is the only thing that is true, like tonight. see often. I'm going to meet him again in Paris. He's a writer also. He writes for Gallimard, very uh, inspired books about the fact that we are all dead already anyway and um, only God can save us. And the reason I mentioned God is because we, one of you, spoke of enthusiasm and uh, of course the etymology of enthusiasm is God, to be in God, to be with God, to be moved by God. And there are many names we can give to God or the higher power. Um, another name was in French Sentiment Océanique. And you can find that in Freud's opening of. Um, I always forget the English title because they changed from German. They basically is Discomfort in Civilization or. And Freud says, oh, there's this thing that a friend who is a writer uh, told me, he says, yeah, but we have this oceanic feeling of being one with every, every being in the world, every entity. 
and Freud says, I, I, I never really understood that, I can admit it. And I think the truth is that Freud knew of it, but he was so preoccupied trying to build a science that would look like real science, that he needed to evacuate everything that would feel a little bit too poetic, too religious, not evidence-based. And unfortunately, this is how a lot of people still think today. I mean, we are on building B here of Stockholm University, perhaps there on C or D is the philosophy department. Very analytical, very preoccupied with appearing to be as scientific as possible and logic, which can lead to interesting propositions, but of course uh, we are not only logical machines and sometimes what looks like a logical fallacy might be actually a breakthrough. Sometimes the more logical we are, the more lost we feel. And of course, the worst is perhaps not to feel lost. The worst is not to feel lost, never. Because that might mean that your life, if it's a tree, doesn't have any branch. And perhaps the trunk is so thin that, in fact, comes a stronger wind, it will fly away. So we want to be lost in the way we try different ramifications. thoughts, propositions, and it distinguishes three forms of understanding. We just spoke of the first one, the analytical, which is important because it helps us divide realities that might be a bit overwhelming or complex into parts that we understand better in order, hopefully, to reconstruct them. But of course, the analytical understanding has a problem with that reconstruction, reintegration of things. Then there is the dialectical form of understanding. And it is related, first of all, to dialogue. And dialogue can do a lot, we know that since Socrates. Something happens when two people talk and when one of them is, at least, is listening very carefully that looks a little bit like the spiral we were talking about. And this is what I do at the Philosophical Parlor in Stockholm. I, I have a dialogue 
with people and I don't try to apply a, a methodology that would be too rigid but I also know that I'm trying to take this dialogue into the domain that I call creolectical which is the third form of understanding and it's based on the idea that yes in fact there is something that we could call a form of divinity. Some prime mover, some higher power, some creative flow, infinite abundance of possibilities of which we only actualize a very, very tiny part. But we can always actualize something new. I call that the Creole, the real with a C, C of creation. And so creolectical understanding, well, is this regenerative form of being in the world that precisely allows us to invest ourselves in our life in a way that actually transforms even the stuckness into a form of inhabiting the world that is healthier, more attentive to diversity, pluralism, the unheard of. And sometimes the unheard of is hiding right in the middle of the ordinary. Perhaps it's just a matter of the ordinary being able to travel or we being able to travel within the ordinary. There is this book by an 18th century French author which is called Traveling Around My Room. There's another book by a Portuguese author, José Lemago, which is about the fact that, yes, metaphorically, we have so many blind spots. And sometimes even we, we, we get a bit angry about it, we get disappointed and we blame the others. They're all zombies, they're all blind, why don't they see? But the truth is, is that probably in that bus where you're thinking like that, probably half of the people are thinking the same thing at the same time. These people, they don't even talk to each other on the bus. If we could put a microphone somewhere in their brain, that would be an ex in ex interesting experiment. We are about to enter the last moment of our unapologetically unacademic lecture. And we haven't gotten into much trouble. Perhaps that's a weakness. Perhaps I should have done something more risky but why force it? I did try to 
make this time as present as possible. The opposite perhaps of a voyage, in the sense that sometimes people give to a voyage which is an escape. telling you what I would like to do in the future. This is usually how an academic talk ends. My research projects... My research project is... Creolectics and philosophical health and philosophical counseling. And one of the things I would like to do is to see if I can help people when at a given moment of their book of life they feel these ramifications and they wonder which one will be fecund, which one will allow me to multiply healthily, which one on the contrary might look very attractive but should in fact be pruned for the sake of the tree as a whole. And that's a question I hope to answer with you back here perhaps in 10 years. I was struggling to remember the last word. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we can have a little bit of questions and comments if you want.